We'll read from the text this morning of God's word to us in 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 12 through 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. God, we pray for your grace to hear your word this morning, for your spirit to illuminate it, and for it to open our eyes and open our hearts to see and to believe and to do. We trust that your world will not return void. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I think a lot of us would say that uh, there's a lot of things we do to avoid unpleasant surprises. I, I don't know if you like surprises or not, but there's a lot of things we do in life to make sure we're not surprised by anything. Uh, that's why we have fire drills, which we're not going to have this morning, but that's why you have those in uh, tornado drills and why you go see the doctor once a year perhaps for a, a yearly physical. We don't like to have surprises and we like to know what to expect. We like to know what's coming. In 2004 when I right before I had back surgery my surgeon explained to me how I'm going to feel when I'm done. He said Mike this is what's going to happen. When you wake up from surgery it's going to feel like some really strong dude punched you in your back as hard as he possibly could. And when I woke up, he was 100% accurate. That's how I felt for a good two weeks. A woman giving birth to a child expects to go through pain. A soldier going into combat expects to go against an enemy soldier who wants to take their life. And as we look here at 1 Peter chapter 4, I trust your Bibles are still open to that. I would ask you this today. If you want to do the will of God and you want to be where God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do, what kind of life should you expect? If somebody's in the will of God, what kind of life should they expect? Now, should we expect prosperity and health, popularity, where everyone would like you? Is that what the Bible promises. And here's the argument Peter's going to make for his first century audience. It would be strange for a Christian who's in the middle of the will of God to live a life with no persecution and no suffering. In fact, he tells him it shouldn't be strange to you at all if you go through any kind of suffering in life, if you're doing what God wants you to do. Especially when you consider this, that God promises the exact opposite of an easy Life. Now, here's what Peter wanted his audience to know. There's a purpose for these sufferings, these trials. They're not meaningless. It's not because God wants us to go through pain or that he enjoys seeing his children go through pain. The purpose for this is to refine you, to test you, to bring out what's really in our heart, the tested genuineness of our faith that we read in chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. It's also got a purifying effect in your life. It purifies us. It refines us to be more conformed into the image of God. That, friends, is what is expected for those who are in the will of God. Make no mistake about it. If you're doing what God wants you to do, if you, friend, are living in a way that pleases him, we should expect to suffer. It should not be a strange thing to consider. Here's what we're going to really take home with us today and what you're going to find in the verses that we've already read is, is simply this. The one central truth you could take home is that trusting in God's faithfulness, that's what enables you, friend, to rejoice when you suffer, when you suffer for doing what 
pleases God. That's going to be the key today. We can rejoice when we suffer. And the other thing is this, that make sure that when we're suffering, we're suffering because we're pleasing God. Now, here's what you don't want to miss with all this talk of suffering. Peter has how many chapters, friends? How many chapters? Five. He has five chapters. And in almost every single one of those chapters, he deals with the whole issue of suffering and going through pain. But then he also deals with this, this, this issue of joy and rejoicing. How is that possible to go through that and to suffer at the same time? Let's look at six things today. We'll take the text and break it down verse by verse. And he's going to give us six admonitions that are going to really help us uh, as we deal with our suffering. And then ask this honest question. Is my suffering for doing what pleases God or is my suffering due to something I have brought on myself? Here's the first thing to look at is this. Is don't be surprised by this. This is a normal part of Christian living. Look at verse 12 if you would. Beloved. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Look at that first word in verse 12. It's one of my favorite words in scripture. And and I wish in our normal English vocabulary we use this word more. Beloved. This, friends, is how we should consider one another. Beloved by God. Beloved by one another. And these were not just casual acquaintances of Peter. He refers to them as the beloved, dear, precious saints that he had this longing affection for. And since these were not just social media acquaintances to him, these were these were people who he considered to be the beloved. Whenever you love someone, you really care about someone, you care very deeply about sharing truth with them. And that's what he wants to do. Because he loves them, that's why he wants to share truth with them. So what truth does he want to share? Notice these words. Look down at the verse in verse 12. Do not be surprised. We should not be shocked when suffering comes, when pain comes in life, especially for doing right. Think of the words of Jesus. John 16, verse 33. In this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, how many of you would say this, that you believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that the words of Jesus are totally accurate and totally dependable and trustworthy? Let me see your hands. So this is what Jesus promised you. He said, in this world, there's going to be problems. And in fact, he says in John 15, 18 through 20, that the world hated me before it hated you. So this is what you should expect as you live in this world, that you're going to experience some hatred for standing for him. And then he says this, what kind of trial are you going to have? Notice what he says. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial. There's a lot of things in life I can't predict. I have no idea who's going to win the NFL games today. I have some ideas who I'd like to see lose, but but I have no idea who's going to win. I cannot predict that. But according to God's word, here's what I can say. If we're in the will of God, as this text teaches, if we're in the middle of what God wants to do in our lives, we are going to suffer. There's going to be pain. Now, if you look at the verse carefully in verse 12, who's the one behind all of the suffering? Who's the one sovereign over it? Who's the one who ordains it? That's right. God is the one who ordains this. You find this a lot in scripture. You find it especially like in narratives like Job. God is the one who ordained that. You find it in the book of Ruth where God's the one who ordained the the issues that she was going through. You find it God's sovereign hand in in the book of Esther as, as God is sovereignly working in that. And he's doing this here in our trials. And this fiery trial could mean a number of things, a variety of ways that in which we could suffer. But here's what it's doing. God does this, you find in the text, to test you. What's really in your heart? What's the genuine reality of our hearts? That when we're tested and we go through, to borrow from the book of Isaiah, the language he uses, this furnace of affliction. When we go through that pain, what is God going to reveal? Two truths about trials you get from this. Number one is this. Trials are to be expected for every one of us who proclaim the name of Christ. We should expect this. Here's the second thing. They have a purpose in your life. 
They have a purpose. They're not meaningless. God has a reason for these trials. And you know what they are? It's to test you. To test the authenticity, the genuineness of your faith, what is really in our hearts. Now think of Peter's audience for a little bit here. They were first generation Christians. They had never gone through rejection before. They had never lived as Christians before. They didn't have moms and dads, more than likely, who were believers. These are first-generation Christians. So they go from people who just lived in the Roman Empire that was polytheistic, all kinds of gods and false deities, and all kinds of paganism in their culture. And now they've come to know Christ, where they worship the one true and living God. And now they're experiencing things they've never gone through before, namely family estrangement, losing their jobs and properties because they believe the gospel, possibly even being physically assaulted for the name of Christ. And Peter here encourages them, don't be shocked by this. Don't be surprised by this. This is to reveal what's really in here, what's really going on in your heart. It's kind of the stress test of Christianity. What can our heart handle and what is our heart going to reveal when we go through unexpected trials. I remember an old story I've heard several times. In the old Soviet Union, Christians would often be in prison. And there was a, a prison camp where they kept many of, of the followers of Christ. And several Soviet soldiers walked into this cell where there were many Christians who lived. And they said, look, we're going to make you a deal here. If you deny Christ, we're going to let you go free. If you deny Christ. All you have to do is deny the Savior and you get your freedom. So what do you think happened? Several of them did. They denied the Savior, and the, the soldier said, okay, we're keeping our word. You get to go free. So as soon as they were gone, and you couldn't see them anymore, the soldiers shut the doors, put their rifles down, and said this, good, I want you to know something. We're Christians too. We're also believers. We just wanted to make sure that we would come in worship with people who were genuine Christians who would not deny the name of the Savior even under incredible pressure. And friends, this is how I think many of our trials work. They work this way, that, that we're tested. And here's the severity of our trial to see if you really will trust God when you're under unimaginable pressure and stress in life. Here's a second thing, another admonition that Peter gives to the suffering believer for doing what is right. Look at verse 13, and that's to rejoice when you have all kinds of sufferings, namely when you share Christ's sufferings. Look at verse 13 again, if you would. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Now here's what Peter points out here. There's a natural byproduct of belonging to Christ. And he tells here his readers to rejoice. What do we normally rejoice about? Can you think about some things? What do we normally rejoice about? We like to rejoice when life is going well. When there's money, when there's health, when there's possessions, when there's things going our way. But Peter has the audacity here to tell them to rejoice when they're suffering. And what's the basis of their rejoicing? Now notice what it does not say. You don't want to be careful about this because... Peter does not say rejoice because you love pain. I don't know anybody who loves pain. Um, Peter doesn't say rejoice because you like losing loved ones or you like losing your job. And, and he doesn't say rejoice because it's so awesome when family members reject you because you love the Savior. He doesn't say that. What is the basis for rejoicing? Notice what the text says. Because you, notice the word share, it's a, it's a deep word in the Greek, and it means you literally share life with the sufferings of Christ. You know what the basis of your rejoicing is, friends? It's not the fact that life is pain-free, because it's not for anybody. It's not the fact that life is easy, because it is not for anybody. The basis of our rejoicing, even when we're facing incredible amounts of suffering and pressure, is our union with Christ. It's our union with him. You share life with him. Something to keep in mind, the very people who might give you a hard time for your standing in Christ because you love the Savior and, and you witness the people and, and you're different, those people who ridicule you and malign you, do you understand something? That if Jesus 
we're on earth at this time, which he's not. He's ascended up into heaven. Praise God for that, right? But, but we're his representatives. But if the Savior were on earth right now, you know they would give him a hard time as well for the very same things that you stand for? And how do I know that? Because of what the Bible says. We just heard a great special. Jesus loves me, this I know for what, friends? The Bible tells me so. Maybe you could word it this way. I will suffer, this I know. Why? For the Bible tells me so. Nobody wanted to repeat that one, so let's say it again. I will suffer, this I know. Why? For the Bible tells me so. That's why I know that. And Jesus, remember when I asked earlier, I think I saw almost every hand raised, and you know, I don't normally do that. Like I see that hand come here, come forward, I see that hand. But I want to hold you a little bit accountable here since we believe the words of Jesus to be true. I get this from the Savior who said, this world will not like you. This world will hate you because, not how we look, not how we smell. The world will hate us because the world first hated who, Christian friend? Jesus. I will suffer this I know why. For the Bible tells me so. The wonderful thing about Peter is he lived this out in his life. You read in Acts chapter 5, you, you can turn there if you want, I can narrate it for you. In Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 41, Peter is standing before a Jewish council, and they're not happy with Peter at all. And they're telling Peter, you need to stop filling Jerusalem with your doctrine. Now, what does that mean? The word doctrine means teaching. He was spreading Christianity throughout Jerusalem in such a way, it was driving the unbelievers nuts. And so they said, you've got to stop this, Peter. And to threaten him, the Bible uses the word, they flogged him. What does the word flogging mean? It means they beat him. They beat him badly. And you're not just talking about a slight beating. This is a deep, painful beating that, that Peter went through. And when Peter got done with that, and he leaves, the punishment that he got for preaching the gospel, what do you think Peter did? Did he have a pity party? Did he turn in his letter of resignation of being an apostle? He said, Jesus, I know you chose me, but I'm done with this stuff. What did he do? And this is one of my favorite responses to persecution that you find in scripture. Here's Peter's response and others when they left the council. Read together with me. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. One theologian writes this, their suffering was not a threat to their spiritual life, but a pledge of the reality of their union with Christ. Now jump down to verse 14, if you would. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. The word insulted here means abused, slandered, ridiculed. It can also uh, carry the idea of being reproached for the name of Christ. And, and what does the text say here, friends? If that happens to you, if you're insulted and you're uh, reproached for the name of Christ, and, and maybe even abused for the name of Christ, and I don't think that's a far-fetched thought with the trajectory of the morality in our nation, it is growing increasingly hostile to biblical truth. So if that happens, here's what the Bible says. You are blessed. Now, how do we often think of blessed? Again, we think, I'm healthy, wealthy, things are going well, therefore I'm blessed. But according to this, you're blessed. And why? Not because life is easy and not because you don't go through pain. You have the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, who lives inside of you right now. He indwells you. And the Spirit of God is, is a comforter, he's a helper, he's a paraclete, and he rests, notice the text, he rests upon you, and he gives you comfort. And this, friend, is evidence that you belong to him. It's that comfort that the Spirit of God gives you. So now we don't see uh, suffering as a threat. You know what you should see it as? A badge of honor. Just like Peter did. I am honored that I get to be insulted for the name of Christ. Even in our easily offended culture today, we can say, if I'm insulted for the Lord, you know what it is? It's an honor. It's an honor to be insulted for the name that is above every single 
name. So if you're truly united with Christ, you'll share the life of Christ. If you share the life of Christ, you're going to become more like Christ. If you're becoming more like Christ, you'll share the life of Christ in this way, according to this text. You'll suffer for him. We'll suffer. It's going to be a part of our lives. So be prepared to suffer, but also this. Here's the one thing that just doesn't humanly make sense. Be prepared to rejoice as you suffer. Because your rejoicing has a basis, and it's not the fact life is easy, and it's not the fact that everything's going well. It's the fact you share the life of Christ. His life is your life. I will suffer, this I know. Why, friends? For the Bible tells me so. Somebody wisely wrote this. This is so wise. Faith realizes that the ground of rejoicing does not lie in the suffering itself, but in the fellowship with Christ that it brings. So we suffer, and, and there's joy there. Again, I'd ask you this. Uh, I, think, I know all of you have suffered here. And, and some of you I know well, and, and you suffer deeply, and you continue to suffer deeply in life. But I also know this, that because many of you have that has opened up the door to, to such sweet fellowship with the Lord because of the suffering you have gone through. And again, friend, the basis of that is the union you have with Christ. Let's look down at the next verse here. Is we should suffer for doing good and not... For doing evil. Let's look at verse 6 or 15 rather. Let's look at this together. But let, let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Now here's what Peter's saying here. Don't suffer for the things that naturally have consequences for them, that, that have just consequences for them. Don't suffer for things that, that have punishment. The idea here is that sometimes people suffer for serving Christ. Sometimes they do. And sometimes people suffer because of their own doing, because of their own choices that they make. So he tells them to refrain from some things. And the first one is murder. And you think, well, of course, I'm not guilty of that. But the New Testament, as you know, goes deeper. The New Testament really cuts into our attitudes that if we have hatred towards another person, according to the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, the book of 1 John talks about this, that's murder in our heart. That's hatred in our heart. So any type of attitude, resentment, scorning, scoffing, belittling, that's not why we should suffer. We shouldn't suffer for those types of heart attitudes. Then he goes down to one that's easily explained as a thief. I don't think you need me to explain that. A thief is somebody who simply takes what is not theirs. And, and they take what God has not sovereignly ordained for them to have. And then he goes down to use the word evildoer. This is just, you want to summarize that? That's a troublemaker. Somebody who causes mischief everywhere they're at. It's just constant trouble everywhere. Then he talks about the word meddler. And you want to unpack this a little bit. Uh, normally when we think of meddling, somebody stepping on our toes, butting into our business, but the idea here is meddling into the business of the unsaved. Trying to get the unsaved to live in a certain way that God does not expect them to live because they don't have the Spirit of God. And what he's saying here is this, you know, you're butting into things that are not your concern, and, and I think we all know this, uh, meddling can cause a lot of trouble in our lives, can it not? Amen, right? Just jumping into something that God has not ordained for us to be a part of. And here's an important question. Anytime suffering happens in our lives, here, here's an important question. Here's suffering, and, and there's a problem here. It's a good time to take a time out and ask a very sincere question and ask this. Am I experiencing this because I brought this on with my own sin? Is this due to my own decisions? Or am I experiencing this because God has ordained this in my life? Now, if it's because of our own sin, we should confess that immediately to God. And God is faithful and God is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just as we sang, how great is our God. Amen? And, and God forgives the foolish decisions that we make. And we can all praise God for that. And then, then we turn from that in repentance, but at the same time, understand, uh, that's not suffering for doing what pleases God. 
That's suffering because of our own evil choices. So let's do some heart probing questions here. And this is not going to be easy. But we have to do this. In order to obey the spirit of this verse, let's ask this. Are we sometimes criticized as Christians for things we bring on ourselves? How many of you would agree with that? At times we are. And I think we ought to ask some really deep, heart-cutting questions. Things like this. Am Am I criticized because I'm too quarrelsome? Maybe too combative on social media. There, there are some individuals, I think, that um, it's kind of like our, our dog Lucy. I cannot hide treats from her. She just has a nose to find it all the time. You know, she will find it every single time. And I think there are some individuals like that, that, that and I'm not saying here in this room, but, but individuals who proclaim the name of Christ who just have a nose for quarrels. They love them. They just love quarrels. And... Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't like quarrels. Are you with me on that? I mean, you know, if you get mad and you say, I want to meet you out in the alley, I'll be like, you know, you know you're bigger than me. I don't, I don't say that to many people, but I just don't like that sort of thing. But, but there's, there are some Christians who are known for that. And friend, that's not a good testimony. That does not bring praise to the name of Christ. Are we ridiculed maybe because we meddle in the lives of non-Christians when we realize they walk in darkness? They don't have the Spirit of God. They don't belong to him. Here's the big takeaway I think you can get from this. And looking at all of our hearts today, and and just being honest as we look and probe into our hearts. Here's the big takeaway. Let's be sure that our suffering is because we're honoring the name of Christ, not because of our own sinful actions. Let's be very sure that our suffering is because we're honoring the name of Christ, not because of our own sinful actions actions. Fourth is this, is to never be ashamed. Never be ashamed to suffer as a Christian. Look at verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Now here's what he's getting at with this. The sense here is is one being reviled, persecuted, mistreated, and, and even abused because they're a Christian, because they proclaim the name of Christ. And even though others slander them and ridicule them and tear them down and, and might even do physically bad things to them because they're a Christian, the idea here is this, they keep on glorifying God. They don't stop bringing glory to his name. Now keep in mind, in the first century, the word Christian had much different connotation than it does today. If you were called a Christian, that was a slur. That was almost like what you would call a byword or, you know, just a a bad word you would call someone. Christians were those who got tried. Christians were those who were ridiculed and rejected. Christians were those who were perhaps even put to death for the name of Christ. And Peter tells his audience, it is an honor for that to happen to you. Don't be ashamed of that. Never be ashamed of the name of Christ. I know it's easy to say here. Because the vast majority of you love the Savior. Praise God for that. But it might be really tough at school tomorrow. And it might be difficult at the workplace. And it might be difficult the next time your family comes together. Friends, let's not be ashamed of him. It was Jesus who said, if you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you. And we read in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the what, friends? Of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the greatest ways... To show that Christ is preeminent in your heart, that he's your greatest treasure, is that when you're reviled because you love him and you're doing what pleases God, you keep bringing glory to his name. You keep praising him. You know, most of us, we're a little picky about the pictures that um, we get taken of us. I don't know if anyone here has ever untagged uh, a picture of yourself on Facebook. I have to admit, I've done that from time to time. Some of those pictures make me look too skinny, so I'm like, no, I'm bigger than that. So I'm not letting you post that picture. But, you know, we, I remember the days, and I'm getting old enough to say this now. Remember the Polaroid cameras? How many of you remember those things? And it was like the coolest thing. Yeah, within a minute, you've got a developed picture, and you can hang it up right away. And, uh, and then, then we started getting uh, film developed, like, within a week, then within a day, and then, then it got so high tech, you could get one hour photos. Remember how cool that was? And I don't know if, 
I talk to anybody anymore who gets their pictures developed. Maybe you do, and I'm sure you'll track me down after the service. But one of the neat things about technology is, is we can just take instantaneous pictures. But even though we have that, we still care deeply, usually, about how we look. 20 years ago, nobody used the word selfie. Now there's not a day that goes by that we don't hear that word. And think, you know, when somebody takes a selfie, usually they want that to be somewhat appealing, wouldn't you think? But I want you to think of it this way. Your life, your testimony, the way we live, the way we talk, the, the way we walk in our lives, that's a selfie of the character of God to the world we live around us. It's a selfie of Christ-likeness. And when we're a Christian and God has bought us and purchased us with the blood of his dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ, what we're saying to the world is, I am not ashamed of the Savior who loves me. I'm not ashamed of him. Even if you persecute me, I'm not going to be ashamed. And we're still to glorify God even when we're persecuted. Here's a fifth thing with this. I'll hasten through this is to keep an eternal perspective. Look down to verse 17. Now we're going to get into this whole deal of, of punishment. So you're, you're suffering for doing what is right. It's important to keep this eternal perspective. It says in verse 17, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Now think of that word judgment. We normally think, okay, just for those who reject Christ. And that verse does refer to that. But it has a much broader connotation here. Okay, the word judgment here could mean for bad evaluations and then also good evaluations. So a literal translation of this would be judgment from the house of God. And, and I think people are very pure in their motives when they say this, but I, I think a bit biblically misguided when they say, I want to go to church because I want to gather in the house of God. And they get that, I think, a lot. And I said it years ago as a young believer, they get that from the Old Testament when they're thinking of the tabernacle or the temple. But this building, if, if it burned down today, and I hope it doesn't, um, but if this building burns down, we are still a church, amen? Because the household of God is not the brick and mortar here. The household of God is you and me and everyone who has the Spirit of God dwelling in them. We are the household of God. And Peter's judgment is not destruction or condemnation. Here's what he has in mind, purification. Back in chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, he talks about these trials test the genuineness of your faith. Is your faith real? Now look at the second part of the verse and think of it this way. If God is purifying his own cherished, loved possession, his people, and if God is purifying us through trials, think of the judgment that's going to come to those who die and ultimately reject Christ. Look at the verse. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those or for those who do not obey the gospel of God? What kind of judgment do you think is coming to those who reject the gospel? And that's why I'd encourage you here today. If, if you're still in that stage where you say no to Christ and yes to your self-righteousness or yes to your church, or yes to your baptism, but you're not trusting by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Take it on the authority of this book, which is the highest authority. There is a judgment that comes to those who die without Christ. Why doesn't that happen for Christians? Well, because Christians, our judgment happened at the cross where the full wrath and the full judgment that we deserve, that Michael James Hess deserves, was poured out upon the, the pure and holy Son of God in my place. So I don't have to sit here and, and sweat bullets, even though I'm sweating because it's a little bit warmer day for January. I'm not sweating because I'm nervous about eternity. Trust me. I'm sweating here today because it's a little hot in here. Amen, church? A few of you would say that. 
But I'm not nervous about eternity because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt my wrath and my condemnation was poured out upon the Son of God at the cross. And I depend upon no earthly title to save me. I depend upon no earthly goodness in myself because I do not have that. I trust alone in the Son of God. So you ask this question, how does this purification come? And the text teaches us through suffering. And he alludes back to Proverbs 11, verse 31. The fire of God's holiness, something not talked about a lot today, is so intense that we feel it as Christians when, when God disciplines us. And he always does that in love because God is so gracious and so good. But the godless person, and, and what you mean by godless is this, they have no thought of God, no reverence of God, no care for what pleases God whatsoever. That person will, by implication, if you look at verse 18, that person, by implication, will find it in a fire of eternal condemnation. And how does God purify his people today, friends? He does it through a number of ways, but one of the means he does that is when we go through suffering, when we go through tests, when we go through trials. Read with me Acts 14, if you would. Acts 14, verse 22. This is the testimony of of the early church. Follow along with me as I read this. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And all of us can testify to that. We just don't have one trial in life. They keep going and going and going. I remember what Benjamin Franklin said one time, my friends come and go, but my enemies, they multiply. Um, That's the same thing that's true with your trials. You just don't have one. They continue on in life. And you have them over and over and over again. And they have a purifying effect. And keeping this eternal perspective, not just thinking about today, not just thinking about what I want to do today, but the eternal perspective helps us realize the most gratifying words we'll ever hear as a Christian is not, you got the job, you got the pay raise, you got the house, you got a clean bill of health, Those are all great. It's not, wow, you look really nice today. It's not that. The most gratifying words we could ever hear as a Christian are, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. So the simple question is this that I have for you today before we get to our last verse here. Are you, friend, ready to stand before God? Are you ready to stand before him? And if you stand before God, are you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, certain that you stand before God by faith in his son? Is that what you would say today? And the good news is this, you can come to faith in Christ right now, right where you're sitting, in your heart, cry out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I have sinned against you. I've turned against you. I turn from my sin and my self-righteousness, and I repent And I turn and I trust in Jesus Christ alone. And only those where that's happened in their lives are totally prepared to stand before God. Now, why can we do this? Why why can we really trust him and rejoice when we go through suffering? And the reason is this, is that you can entrust yourself to your faithful God. Let's spend some time talking about God's faithfulness. Look at verse 19. Therefore, with all those things in mind from the previous paragraph, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So when suffering comes, you have an example. And that example is Christ. You find that in chapter 2, verse 23. How did Jesus handle suffering? The worst kind of suffering. He entrusted himself to his faithful father. And that's what God expects us to do. I don't have to take matters into my own hands. I I can trust in my faithful father. And this word entrust yourself to him, that word entrust, same word used, Luke chapter 23, verse 46, talking about Jesus. Same exact word. We can entrust ourselves to him. And notice how God is referred to here. Two words, faithful creator. Who is the creator of all things? What does that mean? He's sovereign. He made you the way you are. He made the world you live in, made all of your surroundings. Uh, Your DNA was not an accident. God made that. Your creator made that. In fact, he's so intimately involved in your life that 
When you were in your mother's womb, he wove you together, Psalm 139 teaches. And before we had any days, uh, he numbered them all. He is our sovereign creator, which has enormous implications on how we live. We realize life is not an accident. Life is not a chance. Now, why should you trust in him? Here's an important question to ask. I want you to wrestle with this. Why should you trust him? Why should you trust God? If, if they bring somebody to a witness stand, they want that witness to be a credible witness. So why should you trust in God? Look at the verse, friend. Look what it says about God. Entrust their soul, second part of the verse, to a, what's that word there say? Faithful creator. This is why you should trust him. Because God is faithful. Amen? He's faithful. What does that mean? It, it's more than just to him. As great as hymns are that talk about this. But God is faithful, which means everything God speaks is true. God is faithful in that he cannot lie. Everything he says is right. You can always count on him. The, the basis of all of our hope as Christians is the fact God is faithful. He's faithful to his promises. God not only makes promises, praise God, he makes good on all of his promises. Every last one of them. And just like us, when, when we make a promise, you know, our name's on the line. Our character's on the line. And God, when he makes a promise, the same thing is true. And God always follows through on his promises. Because we have a faithful God. To deny God's faithfulness is to deny God himself. It's to deny his goodness. It's to deny his love. It's to deny his character, his promises, his wisdom, his power, his care. It's to deny all of those things. Let's chew on this for a little bit here. Let's read together Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. Just keep in mind, Jeremiah was discouraged. He saw his city just ransacked and destroyed. He had no hope. He was depressed. He was down. But he called this to mind. This is why he had hope. Read this together. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Look with me at 2 Timothy 2 verse 13. Let's read together. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. This verse does not say entrust yourself to yourself or entrust yourself to your own giftedness or your own resources or to even to your spouse, or even to another Christian. It says, entrust yourself to your faithful God. So what is God's will for your life? What is God's will for your life? It's right here in verse 19. To entrust yourself to God's faithful care as you do good. As you do what pleases God. Trust yourself to him. So entrust yourself to him when you're ridiculed at school. And you're made fun of because you love Jesus more than you love popularity. You entrust yourself to him when you look at a field of crops and there's no rain. I know that's not relevant today because there's a lot of rain. But I'm talking like in June, in July, in August, in September, and the field is dry. And, and you wonder, how am I going to make it this year? You have no idea how you're going to make it. You entrust yourself to him. You entrust yourself to your faithful God. You can entrust yourself to him when struggling with infertility, the loss of a child, struggles with our own children. You can entrust yourself to him. You can entrust yourself to him when it seems like nobody listens to you when you share the gospel. It's like, I'm not seeing any fruit here. I'm, I'm sharing Christ with others and there's just no fruit. You entrust yourself to him. And you entrust yourself to him when the car won't start, the furnace goes out, the air conditioner doesn't work, when unexpected expenses come, we can pause and say, yeah, that furnace is a piece of junk, but my God is a faithful God, amen? And you can entrust yourself to him when you want nothing more than to sincerely please God. That's all you want to do. You want to love him. You want to please him. You want to glorify him. And it seems like everyone's turning against you for doing that. And all you want to do is sincerely glorify him. Wrestle with this question. Is your God worthy of your trust? And to that, we can emphatically say yes. Knowing all of this, 
Just as pain from surgery is to be expected, pain in childbirth is to be expected. Suffering as a Christian is not strange. It's to be expected. I will suffer, this I know, why? Finish it with me. For the Bible tells me so. Trusting in God's faithfulness, friends, enables you to rejoice in suffering when you're doing what pleases God. Let's bow for prayer together, shall we? Father, thank you for this rich passage of truth. And we must constantly feed upon this. And I pray that the word of Christ would dwell rich in our hearts, that we would love you, serve you, and magnify you with our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said together.